Well, so great to be with you in this place. Love to be with you. If you are joining us right now across the street by video uh, or listening uh, to an audio, gr glad to have this time with you as well. We are jumping into a new series and I want to lead us into that. Before I do, uh, there are a couple of other uh, things I want to just take a moment and pause and pray with you about. Uh, all of us came here knowing the news and probably even smelling the smoke um, as we arrived. There are fires raging. Uh, we know that that is on top of the tragedy that uh, Thousand Oaks experienced this week. Uh, and want to let you know that we have reached out to some churches that we know in those areas to make ourselves available uh, to help out in any way that we can. But I want to take just a moment and pray uh, for the people that are affected by all of that. Also want to acknowledge that it's Veterans Day uh, coming up. It's, uh, in fact, November 11th this year is the 100th year from the end of World War I. That's what marks the beginning of our celebrating Veterans Day. Uh, and it is a chance for us to all remember the veterans since then that have served uh, on our behalf. I was talking with a veteran today, a friend of mine that I ran into, and he was telling me that he is gathering with some other veterans. This is amazing that to me that they are doing this and recruiting some volunteers to go to these devastated communities, the communities devastated by the fire, to sit uh, among the, the homes that have been burnt down and sift through the ashes to find any, anything of value, anything that might have been left behind by those families that they can restore and, and return to those families. That's, that's the kind of people our veterans are. And so let's just take a minute Let's pray for those families and thank God for our veterans today. Father, we do pause right now. Our hearts are heavy with the news of those who have had to flee from their homes in the wake of this fire. Our hearts are heavy for those who have lost so much. We ask for your peace in their lives. We ask for a richness of your grace. We ask, Lord, that you would encounter each one with your hope, with reminders of your love and your presence and your power. We believe you are that God. And so we call out to you for that help. And Lord, I do thank You for those men and women who are mobilizing to serve in this crisis, but have served in so many crises that we have faced. We thank You for our veterans. We don't take for granted that You have provided a way for us to live as a free people. And so I pray that You bless them. You bless those families and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, let me jump into this series that we are calling Life at the Table. The holidays are approaching. The stores already have Christmas trees up, and it's not even Thanksgiving yet. But it, Thanksgiving is less than two weeks away, and we are about to sit at some tables. Maybe you already know whose table you will be at. Maybe you know who will be at that table with you. I won't ask if you like those that will be at the table with you. Whether it's your table that people gather around or it's someone else's, we cherish our moments around our tables. 
Some of you live alone and you might not often have people around your, your table or maybe life is just so busy for you, you rarely get to even set your table. Our tables and the people who sit at tables with us reflect our lives, say a lot about who we are. The same is found throughout the pages of the Bible. Our tables reflect our lives and the tables set in the Bible, they reflect life with God and tell us what that life is like. In fact, there are a lot of tables set throughout the Scriptures and there's no one who sits at more tables throughout the Bible than one and that is Jesus. He loved dinner parties. It's funny to think of that aspect of Jesus' personality but it's evident through Scripture. He was going to parties all the time. And he was even known to keep the party going sometimes. He, if he had to turn water into wine, he'd do it. <laughs> if he had to feed 5,000 with a sack lunch so they wouldn't go home, he'd do that as well. He set the bar really high for entertaining guests. But Jesus could also make things really, really awkward at the table as well. Jesus wasn't afraid to point out when the table politics were getting skewed in favor of the powerful to the exclusion of the poor. He he wasn't afraid to call someone out at the table who who was just getting a little too proud of themselves. He, He wasn't afraid to make a kind of awkward moment in order to get everyone's attention. He had a way of leveling the playing field around the table and demanding that those who sat at the table with him would tell the truth. You never knew what Jesus would do when he came to sit at your table. But it didn't matter who you were. It didn't matter what you were serving. It didn't matter if the elbows he was rubbing were well-dressed or dirty. Jesus was ready for life at the table. And at the table, he showed us what life with God can be like. And that's what I want us to know in this series. Over the next couple of weeks, I want us to know how do we get to live life with God? What happens in that life with Him? And what will that life with God inspire us to do? All of that can be observed around the tables that Jesus set at. And so I want to take you to some tables today that show us uh, the first thing that you have to understand about Jesus at the table. And that is this, that the life we're talking about, the life with God that we're talking about in this series is not a table that you get yourself to. It is a table that you are carried to. You're carried to the table, and until you understand that you didn't get yourself there, you'll never understand what Jesus wants to do with you there. And so we're going to visit three tables today to see how we get to live in the life that God calls us to live with Him. The first table that I want us to visit is, uh, is found in Luke's Gospel. You can see these verses in your bulletin if you want. Let me set kind of the stage of this dinner party. Jesus is invited to dinner where he ends up insulting his host and all of his guests in one of his infamously awkward moments. That's what we're in store for. The story goes that an an important religious leader in the community, a big man, a, a guy who had it all together, everybody looked at this guy and said, wow, I don't know that I'd ever, I'll never be 
like that guy. This big, important religious leader invited Jesus to his house for a large dinner party with his friends. And and Luke gives us this detail that they were all watching Jesus. They could not wait to see what he was going to do. His fame had spread at this point. The masses love him. He's what everybody's talking about. Stories of his miracles have gone viral. And this dinner party is kind of like Jesus being embraced by the upper echelon of society. He's arrived at this dinner party. And so the setting is ripe for one of his awkward moments. Let's look at Luke 14. 12 to 15. Jesus said to his host, this this guy who's brought him to this party, he says, when you put on a luncheon or a banquet, don't invite your friends. Awkward moment. Don't invite your friends, Jesus said. Don't invite your brothers and your relatives. Now, some of us could say amen to that. And, and don't, don't invite all of these rich people because they're just going to invite you back. That's what you're going to get out of it. Verse 13, Instead, invite the poor, the crippled, the lame, and the blind. Then at the resurrection of the righteous, God will reward you for inviting those who could not repay you. Hearing this, a man sitting at the table with Jesus exclaimed, what a blessing it'll be to attend a banquet in the kingdom of God. I don't know about you, for some reason I read that sarcastically. What a party that's going to be, Jesus. (laughs) It's an awkward moment for the impressive crowd at the table. They don't get it. They thought Jesus would be so impressed with them. All the while, they are blind to their own spiritual poverty, their crippled souls, their lame lives. They came to look impressive. Jesus came to find those in need. Is there anyone at this party who knows they need the power of God? Is there anyone at this party in whose weakness God's strength can be made perfect? God's not waiting for you to impress Him. He's waiting for you to present your deepest need to Him. Because it's our need for redemption that compelled the Savior to leave His throne in glory. It's our need for atonement that nailed Him to the cross. It is our need for God's mercy that led Jesus from the manger to the grave. If you got yourself where you are and you're satisfied with that, that's fine. But Jesus came to find you in need. It is your need that gets you to his table and we have to understand that if we're going to understand the life that he invites us to at his table we have to understand that we get there because we need it Jesus says I came to invite those who have no good reason to be at my table They can't offer Him a thing. They can't get themselves there. What Jesus offers is so upside down in this world that unless you realize He's a Savior, He's a rescuer, He's an empowerer, He's a resurrector, He's a hope builder and a truth teller, that's who He is. That's what He came to be for us. It's your need for Him that gets you a seat at His table. You have to understand that before you understand why Jesus wants you at his table. I want to take you to another table set in the Old Testament that illustrates how we get to Jesus' table. The story of this table begins on a tragic day in Israel's history. It's the day that King Saul and his son Jonathan the prince both die 
in battle. Both are killed on the same day. And it's the same day that David then becomes the new king of Israel. And in those days when one royal dynasty ended and a new royal dynasty began, the old royal family would be killed off by the new king. That was the practice of the day. And so when Saul and Jonathan die, Saul's family believes David, the new king, wants them dead. And so they run for their lives. The Bible paints a very chaotic scene as they're running from the army that is coming their way. And then the Bible gives us this little close up, this brief close up of a child in Saul's palace as the family is fleeing. This little child, he's, he's Saul's grandson, a little boy with a big name. His name is Mephibosheth. And Mephibosheth is Jonathan's little boy. He's five years old. And as his family is escaping, this little boy falls out of his nanny's arms and shatters the bones in his feet. And the Bible gives us this little detail. He's crippled the rest of his life and he is practically forgotten about, abandoned by his family. Now 20 years later, 20 years passes over about five chapters of 2 Samuel. And we find in 2 Samuel chapter 9, David is in a reflective mood. He's thinking back over his life. He's remembering things he's gone through. He's thinking about when he fought that battle, when he became king. He's thinking of the fighting and the bloodshed and the friends that he lost. And he remembers Jonathan, Saul's son who had been David's closest friend. King Saul hated David out of jealousy, but Jonathan had befriended David. And so we pick up the story in 2 Samuel chapter 9. David asks this question, Is there anyone still left of the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness for Jonathan's sake? Now there was a servant of Saul's household named Ziba. They summoned him to appear before David. And the king asked him, said to him, are you Ziba? Ziba said, "Uh, at your service, was his reply. Now, you have to understand what they're doing here is they, they think if anyone knows if someone from Saul's family is still alive, it's Ziba. Ziba served Saul's family. He's left over serving David in David's palace here. If anybody knows if someone from Saul's family is still alive, it would be this guy. And so the king asked, is there no one still alive from the house of Saul to whom I can show God's kindness? And Ziba answered the king, there is still a son of Jonathan, but he's lame in both feet. Now, this is Ziba's first excuse for David to to say, you know, there is a guy, but I don't think he's what you're looking for. David says, where is he? Ziba answered, he's at the house of Machir, son of Amiel, in Lodabar. I'm going to tell you a little bit about Lodabar in a little while, but suffice to say, this is excuse number one to say, David, just forget about this guy. He's not worth your time. But David responds, verse 5, so David had him brought from Lodabar from the house of Machir, son of Amiel. And when Mephibosheth, it's this little boy who's grown up, he's he's in his 20s. When Mephibosheth, son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David, he bowed down to pay him honor, still crippled in both feet. David said, Mephibosheth, at your service, he replied. Don't be afraid, David said to him. Now, why would he have to say, don't be afraid? Because Mephibosheth, you remember, was part of the family running for their lives 
thinking David was going to kill them all. Mephibosheth has made it for 20 years hiding out in Lodabar. He's been scared all those 20 years of the possibility that the king might someday find him and bring him into the palace just like this to finally execute him. But David says, don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for the sake of your father, Jonathan. I will restore to you all the land that belonged to your grandfather, Saul, and you will always eat at my table. Mephibosheth bowed down and and said, what is your servant that you should notice a dead dog like me? Isn't that a heartbreaking statement? that he would have that perception of himself. Life can leave us so wounded. Then the king summoned Ziba, Saul's steward, and said to him, I've given your master's grandson everything that belonged to Saul and his family. You and your sons and your servants are to farm the land for him. He's crippled. He can't do it. Bring the crops in so that your master's grandson may be provided for. And Mephibosheth, grandson of your master, will always eat at my table. Now, Zip, I love this little detail. Zip had 15 sons. I'd like to have seen his dinner table (laughs) then Ziba said to the king your servant will do whatever my lord the king commands a servant to do so Mephibosheth ate at David's table like one of the king's sons I love this story life with God is not a table we get ourselves to notice why David shows kindness to Mephibosheth what, what motivates him? David asks, is there anyone I can show kindness to for Jonathan's sake? He doesn't say, is there anyone who deserves to sit at the king's table? Anyone we could reward with some kindness? David's search for Mephibosheth was for Jonathan's sake. This crippled man is given a place at David's table for Jonathan's sake. David made Mephibosheth like one of his own children for Jonathan's sake. He wouldn't even be looking for this young man if not for Jonathan's sake. And I can't help but think of what God does for us for Jesus' sake. He forgives our sins for Jesus' sake. He shows us mercy for Jesus' sake. He loves us as we are and not as we should be for Jesus' sake. He fills our lives with the power of His Spirit. He makes broken men and women whole. He's healed some sick bodies and He's mended some broken hearts not because we deserved it, but for Jesus' sake. And you can turn it around And some of us can think of all the things God doesn't do to us for Jesus' sake. God's gracious invitation to life at the table with Him isn't something you earn. It's something given to you for Jesus' sake. I was talking with a friend this week who's new to faith in Jesus. And you can see this new life happening in her in fact there's there's a kind of joy that lifts her smile when she talks about this new life with God that she has found and I asked her if she was going to get baptized as as just a sign of that new life she's found with Jesus and she said uh, to me well I've thought about it and a kind of hesitant look crossed her face and she said but I'm not ready And then she said this, my faith is so small, I just don't feel like I'm worthy to be baptized. You ever thought that about yourself? I'm not worthy of what God offers me. I'm not worthy of the things that I hear people talk about at God. Maybe other people, I'm not worthy 
of those things. I'm not worthy of God hearing my prayers. I'm not worthy of God forgiving all my sins. I don't, I don't believe enough. I don't, I don't do enough. I don't pray enough. I don't know enough. Maybe someday. And when my friend said, I don't feel like I'm worthy to get baptized, I said to her, you aren't worthy, but you're welcome." God doesn't require us to make ourselves worthy of life with Him. God welcomes us to life with Him for Jesus' sake. If you accept what Jesus has done for you and offers you, then you're welcome into the waters of baptism and into life with God. Don't wait until you're worthy or you'll die waiting because you're not worthy. You're welcomed for Jesus' sake. If not for Jesus' sake, you'd die waiting to be worthy. Mephibosheth would have died in Lodabar had David not carried him out of that place and given him a new life at his table. He rescued him from where he didn't belong and gave him a life he didn't deserve. That's how we get to do life with God. No matter where you are, who you are, what has happened to you, God can find you there and He will carry you out and He will carry you in to life with Him if you will trust Him to do that. Mephibosheth began his life in the palace of a king, but he landed lame in Lodabar. Somebody said, Lodabarsto. It, it, it's not even high to bar, it's low to bar. <laughs> low to bar is nowhere you want to be. Low to bar is a Hebrew phrase that means there's no pasture here, there's nothing alive here. It's a wasteland. Lodabar is where you end up when you have no place to be. Denny's is kind of like that for me. <laughs> I, I never plan to go to Denny's. Somehow I end up there when there are no other options. Right? That's Lodabar. Lodabar is a place of depression. Lodabar, now you're just going to laugh about Denny's. I'm talking about depression here. Let, there are some depressing people at Denny's, but Lodabar is it's loneliness. It's where you get stuck. It's where sin catches up with you. If that's ever happened to you, you were in Lodabar. It's where relationships are broken. Lodabar is disappointment and dissatisfaction and disinterest when you can't possibly fill your life with good enough things, when you're running on empty and you're weary from all the anxiety. That's Lodabar. Lodabar is where you go to hide when you don't want to be found or when you're afraid of what trouble is coming next. Mephibosheth knew his misery began while he was running from a king's execution. And he was in Lodabar because he didn't ever want to be found there. Little did he know that David, the one looking for him, would offer him an invitation instead of an execution. God may be after you. And, and if... God is chasing after you and you have a sense of that. You know He wants you to know Him. It can be frightening when you're chased unless you realize that the one chasing you has exactly what you need to live the life you were always meant for. Are you hiding out in Lodabar when you have a seat at the king's table? He will carry you to the table so that you can receive a life you do not deserve. Mephibosheth could not see beyond Lodabar. He couldn't see beyond his crippled feet and what that cripple, those crippled feet made him. 
He had to be carried out of that place to be given a new place at the king's table. Our sin and our brokenness and the battles that we fight in life, that all of that has left us in need. But it is that need that compelled the king to come and get us. Jesus can carry you out of your sin today, out of your past, out of your fear, out of your anxiety, out of your stubborn pride. He came to carry you out of the mess you've made, the trouble you're in, the emptiness you feel, and the disappointments that you have allowed to define your life. He has come to carry you out of those places. I imagine Mephibosheth had to be carried to David's table. Maybe he was used to dragging himself on the floor. Maybe he had some painful crutches to drag his broken feet from place to place. And people of faith, we have always been criticized as needing a crutch. You you just can't handle life. You need a crutch. God's just a crutch for you because you're too weak. But I say my faith is more than a crutch. My faith is in the one who came to carry me. Where are the needy? Where are the ones who can't get themselves to the king's table? Where are the ones who need the kindness of God? The king, Jesus, has come to carry you to life at His table. Those people at the dinner party with Jesus wanted to show Him how impressive they were, but what He wanted them to know is how they needed Him. They were a bunch of Mephibosheths. They just didn't know it yet. In need of a Savior. In need of a Savior to rescue them and carry them to a table they couldn't get themselves to for a life with God they don't deserve. That's the table that you are invited to. Life at the table starts there. It starts with His grace. This communion table that we're going to turn to is the third table that I want to take us to today. It's the Lord's table. The communion table is where we remember that on the night Jesus was betrayed, He was at a table. And He spoke of Himself as an offering and a promise. That night at the table with His friends, He broke some bread. And when He broke that bread, He said to His friends, this is my body broken for you. That's what He came to do. Didn't have to come. Was not obligated for your sake. Oh no. In His mercy, in total surrender, Jesus allowed His body to be broken as an offering for our sins. And He said, as often as you eat this bread, remember Me. Remember you were broken in need of a Savior. Remember you were in Lodabar. Remember your soul was crippled. Remember your your heart was lame. Remember when your mind was blind to the love and the power of God that you were in so need of. But it was your need that drew Him to you. It's, his, it's, it's still what draws Him to you and me today. It was because you needed Him that He came into this broken world and let it break Him so that He could take the penalty of our sins and remove our shame. At the same table, on that last evening before the cross, Jesus, He lifted up a cup And he said, this cup is a a cup of promise that I make to you. It's a covenant. In fact, the Scriptures tell us, he says, this cup is the new covenant between God and His people, an agreement confirmed with my blood which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. Jacob, would you come on? Jesus said, this is His promise. His life for your life. 
And so to drink the cup of communion is to trust that Jesus has brought to us this invitation to life at the table with God. If you've never trusted Jesus and accepted His invitation to life with Him, you can do it right now. The Bible says that Jesus stands at the door knocking, waiting for you to open your life to Him. And He says if you will open your life to Him, He will come in and He will set a table. The ushers will come and you can take a cracker as that tray passes. You can take a cup, drink from it, and place it back in the tray. All who know their need for Jesus and will trust Him are welcome to the table of the Lord. Let's receive and remember what He's done for us.